under the title uh, dedicated to the topic of um, documenting and researching the dissident movements. Uh, we have three distinguished panelists. I um, will have the honor of introducing them very quickly, not to take up too much of their time to present their work and then to have a discussion about it. Um, right next to me, uh, so that is Benjamin Nathans, who is the uh, Ronald S. Lauder Professor um, uh, of History at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he uh, is currently doing, I hope I'm right about this, research into the history of the dissident movement in the former Soviet Union. Uh, he has many publications, perhaps, perhaps one of the most well-known one is his book, Beyond the Pale, which has received multiple prizes. I won't read them all out here. Um, then with us also is uh, on the far side of the table, Ksenia Kibuzinski. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes. Uh, Ksenia Kibuzinski, who is Slavic Resources Coordinator and uh, also the head of the Petrojacic Central and East European Research Center at Toronto University. Um, she has worked in particular on um, uh, relationships between Slavic or Slavonic culture and French culture, including, for example, uh, the reception of the figure of Mazepa in France. Um, next to her is Anne Komaromi, who is associate, uh, assistant professor at the Center of Comparative Literature, also at the University of Toronto. Um, she is working on Samizdat, also I think partly with an angle on French uh, reception in particular or on reception in Paris. Um, and she uh, approaches her topic, I think, I hope this is correct, from uh, the perspective of literature studies above all. Uh, so I would like to um, uh, invite Ksenia Kipusinski to read out her paper now. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I am probably the only non-specialist present at this conference. So what I am here, I represent the front line in terms of uh, being a librarian who is trying to facilitate the research in which you are all engaged. So what I can bring to you here are just observations of the challenges I see in acquiring, preserving, and making accessible uh, Samizdat and dissident uh, archives. Um, my career is one that requires me to be a specialist of many, many things. Uh, I have been a specialist in Vermontiana knowing about monsters in Lake Champlain. I have been a diocesan archivist uh, for the Archdiocese of Boston. I have uh, been at the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard, uh, specializing strictly in Ukrainian, and now I am responsible for all of Eastern Europe, from you know, including Estonia, Hungary, Slovenia, and etc. So I have to know many, many little things. Uh, so uh, I hope you will uh, be understanding so that I, this is uh, what your students are probably facing and people new to this field. Um, I also feel uh, happy to be here representing the University of Toronto, which has a really strong tradition in documenting dissident movements. Uh, we have incredibly strong collections in underground dissident Samizdat and independent collections, such as the H. Gordon Skilling's collection, and uh, Skilling was the former director of the Center for European and Russian Studies at the university. Uh, he collected widely on the political development of Czechoslovakia from the 1930s to the 1968 uprising and documents relating to the Charter 77 Human Rights Group. Uh, recent uh, other related material can be found in our Petlitsik Samizdat works in Czech and Slovak, for which we had an exhibit in 1988-89 called Padlocked. Uh, we also have 
uh, archives of the jazz section of the Czechoslovak Union of Musicians with works on art, music, and culture. We also have documented the independence movements in other East European countries, uh, including our Polish Solidarity Collection and our most recent acquisition, the Paul Belusovich Collection of Samizda and Independent Press, 1962 to 1991. Uh, an incredibly strong collection that we just acquired last year. Um, challenges. Uh, <laughs> There are many. Um, as someone who's on the front lines of, of helping students, uh, as I serve on a reference desk at the Petrojacic Central and East European Resource Center, um, I rarely, if not ever, have encountered someone coming to me wanting to do research on dissident movement. I've been in the profession since 1991, so this may have been very different in the 70s and 80s, but since the collapse of the Soviet Union, aside from my colleague here and her, one of her students, I have not. But I'm assured by some young Ukrainian researchers that I met at the reception last night that there is strong interest over there, which is heartening to hear. Uh, so I am going to focus mostly on North America because so many of the collections ended up here or originated here. Um, second challenge, my colleagues, uh, archivists and librarians in North America have not done very much to promote their collections of dissident movements. Um, and uh, the North American repositories and their custodians are central to this review, as I mentioned, because so much of the material was either smuggled out of the communist countries to the West and ended up here or was created here. In contrast, our colleagues in Europe have, much, have been much more actively uh, disseminating information about such collections by holding series of exhibitions in the last decade or through the creation of informal networks to share information about their holdings. Um, the professions Inadequate sharing of details about local dissident archives here is reflected in the dearth of literature or guides on the topic in print or online. Uh, a literature review and journal databases and periodicals specializing in Slavic and East European information resources turns up a single reference by Olga Zaleslavskaya of the Open Society Archives in Budapest who in 2008 published a very good article on the past and present state of Samizdat material. Moreover, from the lack of documentation, when I put out a call to uh, the International Slavic Librarians Listserv, uh, this was in November when I was first invited to the conference and I thought I would begin my research early and be on top of things. Um, my query generated only five responses. And of these, only three directed me to some relevant material. Um, my expectations going into the research would be that I would find, uh, I guess naively, a single consolidated, well-developed, and annotated online guide or portal to these collections. Um, and even in the case of Ukraine, which I'm much more familiar with, uh, the State Committee on Archives I, I, it took three weeks for the former head uh, to, to help me find where the links were to the dissident archives. They're buried under a news item. So you cannot find uh, from this, the logical place where you would think uh, any information. Um, the third reason for the difficulties in locating primary source material on the Soviet descent uh, as well as Polish dissidents, is the vastness of the topic. For to consider all aspects of the dissident movements in these three countries, Poland, Russia, and Ukraine, researchers need to access not only material generated by the dissidents and nonconformist groups, and which survives, so Samizdat, correspondence, diaries, memoirs, photographs, sound recordings, 
but they also need access to records of the repressive state, government directives, surveillance reports, arrest warrants, and sentencing decisions, uh, as well as documents generated by activists and organizations outside the Iron Curtain who monitored, detailed, and lobbied against Soviet repression and reprisals, and about which we heard this morning so eloquently and those who participated in the production and distribution of underground publications. So to this list, we can add literary works, news reports, information bulletins, open letters, appeals, declarations, analytical and research reports, press surveys, questionnaires, programs, manifestos, statements, interviews, visual materials such as art, photography, and posters, and I know Christina Isayev mentioned exhibits, uh, what has happened to all this material. Uh, so what follows is a very cursory review of what has been done so far to acquire, preserve, and make accessible Samizdat and dissident archives. And I won't go into great detail because I think my two co-presenters will give you more details about specific collections. Um, the production, circulation, and consumption of Samizdat material involved significant numbers of people. Uh, from the dissidents to nonconformists and their supporters in the West. Um, human rights activists, journalists, governmental and non-governmental organizations. Um, then there are the considerations of production, reproduction, redistribution of the texts, and their movement across national borders as information from inside the Iron Curtain for the text was gathered, smuggled, verified, reissued, and disseminated. With the large scale of this distribution network and the number of individuals and organizations involved in its support, much material ended up dispersed across the entire globe. Presently, the geographical range of repositories and collections, both public and private, containing Samizdat and dissident archives is wide. It can be found in countries in which it originated, Russia, Ukraine, Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, Lithuania, etc but also in other European countries, primarily Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, the UK, France, to a great extent the United States, and to a lesser degree in Canada. Um, I, I think I'm gonna skip over where the material is in North America. I'll just, you know, the Hoover Institution Library and Archives is, is one of the largest, and for example, it houses the papers of Yuri Yarim Agaev and his Center for Democracy in the USSR, papers of renowned dissidents and writers Alexander Ginsberg, Andrei Sinyowski, um, papers of the poet and literary critic of dissident writers Gleb Struve, the family papers of the Pasternaks, papers of the Radio Liberty broadcaster Alexander Vardy, um, uh, the records of the t scientists for Sakharov, Orlov, and Shteransky, and voluminous broadcast tapes and records of Radio Liberty. Uh, at Harvard's Houghton Library is uh, the Andrei Sakharov papers, uh, and within the Sakharov papers are collections uh, such as the papers of dissident historian and dramatist Andrei Amalric, human rights activist and writer Elena Bonner, novelist Vasily Grossman, editor Grigory Gorevich, the photographs of Soviet dissidents collected by Professor Peter Redaway, and the records of various human rights organizations such as Amnesty International and the Committee of Concerned Scientists. Other dissident archives include the Human Rights Watch records here at Columbia, uh, the collection of the electrophysiologist Sergei Kovalev uh, at the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia, the papers of Thomas Venslova, Lithuanian poet, scholar, and professor active, active in the dis Soviet dissident movement, and those of poet Joseph Brodsky at Yale, uh, and the list can, goes on. Uh, Polish dissident movement uh, material is also at the Hoover, it includes Andrzej Timowski interviews with activists in KOR, Solidarność, and other Polish dissident movements, the Marek Rutski collection of underground publications from Poland, uh, the London publishing house Annex, papers of Zyslav Nider, director of the Polish section of Radio for Europe, papers of Polish dissidents Antoni Zambrowski, Jerzy Kropownicki, and Zbigniew Romyszewski, um, as well as collections at other universities. 
sadly, the one area where I would think I would know where things are uh, on Ukrainian descent, um, I cannot find any holdings in academic, large academic institutions in North America. Of course, the largest collection was uh, the Smola Skip collection in Baltimore by uh, Osip Zinkevich gathered, uh, and that is now in Kiev, which is wonderful. That is where people know the language and have interest. Um, but a lot of the activities originated here. Now, that is not to say that the archives are not out there. I, uh, I have just at this conference been gathering information, uh, so, so I think that is promising. And uh, Peter Redway mentioned this morning that it's up to the archivists to collect the material. Well, we need to know where it is, and we, uh, we, we would love. Uh, so I think there needs to be more of a collaboration between faculty and, the, and their librarians and their archivists and, and working together through professional associations. Uh, just as an example, I told my father, I am very close to my father and said, I'm having difficulties with this paper on the Ukrainian. He said, well, let me ask a church and he'll ask someone. And uh, so Kadovansky has a huge archive. And so um, these are the kinds of informal networks that uh, need to be brought to light to those of us who are the custodians of this material. Preservation. Uh, Polish collections have been phenomenally uh, preserved. Uh, that is through efforts by librarians and international associations. Uh, so for example, in April 1982, during the period of martial law in Poland, a group of librarians met in Paris and agreed to undertake a project to combine the holdings of solidarity materials in many different libraries and to create a single most complete collection as possible to be microfilmed and then sold and distributed to libraries. Um, and th these efforts had actually begun six months earlier when this company IDC took the initiative to begin filming of material in Poland under arrangements made directly with Solidarność officials, which at that point was still operating legally. But with the introduction of martial law, the continuation of the project was pursued with Radio Free Europe in Munich. And it moved forward. And uh, the extensive holdings of Radio Free Europe in Munich and the Polish Library in London, uh, the collection was completed in 19, well, begun in 1985 as the Polish Independent Collection. And it includes a wide range of opposition and dissident per periodicals from 1976 to 88 as well as uh, Polish periodicals, underground publications, bulletins, leaflets from factory, local, and regional Solidarność branches, academic and student circles, farmers' organizations, political consortia or parties, and religious and cultural groups. Another collection uh, was filmed in 2005 by primary source Microfilm. And it was based on the holdings of Karta Center Foundation archives in Warsaw. And uh, the, the staff at Karta had collected materials um, and, in, and it had evolved <coughs> into a non-governmental archival repository paralleling the development of the Russian Memorial Society. And aside from its communist era collections, it houses materials from the late interwar period and from the wartime occupations. But its richest holdings are from the final dozen years of the old regime and the rise of solidarity and other opposition movements. Um, and there, one can find documents, diaries of solidarity activists and labor demonstrators, but also those of soldiers and police officers who took part in halting protest actions. Um, other material focuses on the 16th month period of the founding of Solidarity in September 1980 to the imposition of martial law in December 1981. So you, they provide, the records provide the record of the development of the independent strike committees 
to the founding Congress of Solidarity as a self-governing national trade union. Um, other material includes regional and national meeting minutes, organizational statutes, constitutions, etc. Um, now, both IDC's Polish independent publications and primary source microfilms, Descent in Poland, collections were acquired widely. Uh, the first is held by over 10 libraries and the other by over 20. Now, I don't, I, again, use. <laughs> we have the material. I, I do not know how heavily it is being used. Um, and a, a microfilm has been a great preservation medium. It's compact uh, and affordable. But unfortunately, these vendors are getting out of the business. Um, they are, uh, well, for many reasons, either the closing of archives uh, limitations, um, or it's actually probably more profit-based and they've moved on to uh, creating digital packages and um, right now primary source is not taking any new projects that I'm aware of in East Central Europe, which is unfortunate because they've done such amazing work. And, uh, but they are initiating a new program called Archives Unbound where the existing collections are being digitized, but again, resold to libraries with strained budgets, so we may already have the microfilm and now we'll be acquiring again because faculty may want access to the digital content, so uh, that's um, Cataloging and access issues, um, let me go over this quickly and then I want to get to some perhaps recommendations of how we can move forward. Um, clearly, access to me is the most problematic because I'm, to find the material has been quite challenging and uh, at the minimum, it, what I think needs to be done is a survey of holdings and, and minimal information to be gathered. Um, a collection, just a short collection description, a title, creator, historical note, just a paragraph, a summary of contents, a few subject headings to be entered into a local database. So, for instance, Columbia University enters it into their catalog. It gets uploaded into a union catalog like WorldCat where, or, or Archive Grid where we can actually learn about what's held. Um, I can't even imagine or dream of it yet. Uh, full finding aids, folder level, item level. But should that come, these need to be linked to these basic catalog records so that we can find information. Now, there have been movements in that direction happily, and I, I think Anne would know much more about this, but the International Samizdat Research Association was created in 2004 as an informal network of scholars, archives, museums, research centers, and other institutions uh, to provide such information. Uh, and I quote uh, that uh, their efforts are encouraging and supporting international research in Samizdat, dissent in the alternative culture through coordination and collaboration of information technologies and open standards for long-term preservation and broad access. They're, they were thinking big uh, when they came up with this and they envisioned four categories of activities, archives, networking, research, and education. And by far the most ambitious project is the Samizdat Text Corpora, a project aimed to bring together the various linguistic and regional bodies of Samizdat literature in order to create a unified gathering of materials for scholarly research. And the envisioning was the final project would comprise the union catalog and digital repository of Samizdat held by the, the, the association's uh, institutions. And at present, the website has become a bit moribund, um, but there is a directory to 41 institutions that possess some of that and dissident material. But I think we're going to hear a bit more about this. International Samizdat Research Association, they have a portal, but not all the links function, but there is a, to the, on the portal a, a directory of 41 institutions, and when you get to those to the directory and you click, then it brings you. So that, that's a good, good first step. 
Um, another promising, uh, and I didn't have a chance to ske speak with Osip Zinkevich, but uh, the Ukrainian Smoloskip archive was brought to Kiev, and it is actively soliciting collections from dissidents in Ukraine, um, and they publish a, a newsletter, and in the newsletter they actually give you full finding aids of recently acquired material. Uh, so that is a promise. And there is also the promise of an eventually a electronic catalog appearing. Uh, it has not yet uh, come to light, but uh, I, I think that is a good movement. Uh, on a sadder note is kind of the lack of coordination in Ukraine because there, there's also a dissident movement uh, museum that is seeking a home uh, that has not found state uh, sponsorship or been assigned a building. So, um, and I have mixed feelings about, I feel that material should be within the context where it was created. Um, but judging from the lack of interest here, this also has its ben benefits. Um, some ideas or directions for work, and then I will finish. Um, I think uh, there are bodies that can be approached that could facilitate this work, and I'm a member of two such groups. Uh, there is the Committee on Libraries and Information Resources that is part of the Association for Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies, what was formerly AAAS. Um, it, we meet at the same time as our faculty colleagues, um, but uh, there's not a lot of cross-participation. The librarians attend their sessions and the political scientists go to theirs and the historians. So I think um, this is a body that's worth approaching about conducting uh, a, a major survey of material and would be willing to do this and coordinate it um, with faculty input. Another, I think, group that should be approached is the Center for Research Libraries in Chicago. Uh, the consortium numbers 250 members, and as part of its new directions is the Global Resources Network, which is a program, a collaborative initiative um, of CRL and higher academic research institutions to support international studies through the preservation and exchange of knowledge and source materials. The program supports initiatives that expand access to international scholarly resources and promote coordinated collection building. They provide assistance in ongoing sustainable programs that support the study of world regions and subjects not sufficiently documented by the collections of North American institutions. I think that seems like a really good fit. Um, and um, I think I will just conclude with that. I think this, what I've been hearing here, has been very positive, but it's the coordination that really needs to take place. Uh, and I think archivists are interested. And, and maybe the third recommendation, let me throw this in, is um, when we're granting stipends and fellowships to visiting scholars, um, that we not forget about our archivist librarian colleagues. Uh, it, it's important to do the historical research. Uh, it's important to study economics and political science and literature, but um, I think some of the fellowships should go to, to librarians to, to coordinate these projects, to get the training, and to do, to do this work that so desperately needs to be done. So thank you for your attention. Well, we've heard a bit about uh, some of the, the, what needs to be done and also the challenges, particularly in coordinating this work that has to be, I think, just as networked as Samizdat and dissident publicity um, always was. 
Uh, Ksenia spoke about the International Summies Dot Research Association, which was a very promising beginning and has a, a great deal of potential. Uh, that's at the Open Society Archive in Budapest, and Oiga Zaslavska, whom Ksenia mentioned, um, is coordinating that. Um, and my project, uh, which has been to uh, research and describe Soviet Samizdat periodicals between 1956 and 1986, um, is one of the kind of seed projects uh, for that Samizdat corpora larger um, mm -hmm. that that larger um, endeavor. Uh, and it's, it's my hope that what I've done, which is really such a very small and limited um, project to, to document Samizdat, will help stimulate uh, further work and the kind of networked, uh, coordinated efforts that we need. Um, I'm also coming from a perspective grounded in literature, as was mentioned, uh, and, and literary theory and comparative theory. Um, so I'm interested in, in what uh, this project, as I've been working on it and as I see it going into its digital phase, um, helps uh, show us about um, the possibilities and the needs for digital humanities projects, uh, bringing together archival documents, making them accessible, um, and doing that in a way that helps showcase this history to a generation of people that might not be familiar with the topic, even as we try to um, engage former participants in dissident movements um, and their supporters uh, and institutions and archives that have materials to um, come together to make these things um, both accessible and interesting in ways to new generation. Um, and I have in mind the, uh, when I'm doing my work, the stories of remarkable courage and conviction on the part of dissidents and their supporters, which have always inspired me uh, and about which we've been hearing more here. I'm also thinking about ways to translate the dissident legacy to new generations. In a very general way, um, that means to me honoring the value on personal and social ethics in a pluralistic framework, a dissident value about which Miroslav Marinovich spoke yesterday evening. Um, and more specifically, in my field uh, of comparative literature, this means resisting the kinds of theory that try to resolve problems through totalizing systems of thought, whether Marxian, Freudian, and some species of globalized theory. Um, I think we can do networked things that don't uh, involve that kind of um, abstracted, totalizing framework. Um, and in my work, this means finding a way of doing history in the digital age so as to keep in sight always the human element. <clears throat> Johanna Drucker writes about the human element in digital humanities in a way that I find very congenial to what I see as the defining characteristic of Samizdat and digital texts, uh, which is to say their material and epistemic instability. How do we know about particular texts? Uh, we know about them because people copied them, passed them on, reproduced them, and or talked about them as significant. Uh, so treating texts not as automatically fixed entities, the way we might think printed texts are, but as events where people came together to realize a text and to endorse its significance and value, um, whether this was a text with news about rights violations um, or new Ukrainian poetry or Crimean Tatar poetry. Um, this is appro an, an approach to social and historical dynamics of the text that is captured by material hermeneutics. Um, while that term sounds rather pretentious, I think, the idea is relatively simple, and I hope to make clear uh, what I mean by a material 
hermeneutics and its implications um, for a history of dissidents. Hope to make that clear. Dissidents in the Soviet bloc, uh, like social uprisings more recently, depended on texts that were ephemeral. Um, when we consider these texts materially, um, the Sami's Dot text, we see that it is like a Facebook announcement or a text message. The original is ephemeral, and the text has to spread. It has to be transmitted, copied from hand to hand, from typewriter to typewriter, or from screen to screen, in order for the text to live, in order for it to have an impact. This means that any given text will exist in various forms if we know anything about it, and that each of those forms will bear traces of the person or most likely persons who helped realize that particular copy, and that these traces may also tell us something about the particular social and historical situation of the event of that text's realization. Put simply, each copy is slightly different and each copy tells us different things about the circumstances of its realization and the personal uh, community and institutional investments in it. I feel like this point is obvious, but in many cases still not really appreciated. It is not just the content of a Sami's dot text that matters. There's information on the original Sami's dot typescripts that is missing or different from the Western reprint copy, or later reports about it. The Sami's dot original tells us uh, whether a text was typed or handwritten, whether it perhaps combined different elements, manuscript and typescript and or photographs um, in a sort of photographic collage, as in this case, whether it was printed on makeshift or homemade printing presses um, this was rare in the uh, period of classic Soviet Samizdat, that is before perestroika, but we do find it in Baptist Samizdat, for example. It tells us whether a text was valued enough to be hand-bound uh, in a decorative cover or lovingly illustrated, like one copy of Venedikt Yerofeyev's novel, Moskva Pietushki, which we find now in the archive at Bremen. <clears throat> the reprints tell us something too. The amnesty name on reprints of the Moscow Chronicle of Current Events tells us that a highly respected international organization endorsed the veracity of a Sami's dot bulletin. This was extraordinary. The first time amnesty lent its name to an edition not compiled by its own staff. Zoya Krachmaynikova who compiled the Sami's Dot collections of Christian readings under the title Hope, Nadezhda, talked about knowing whether someone would appreciate more the typescript version or the Western reprint version from Pasyev Publishers in Frankfurt. Presumably, some readers valued the underground or homemade quality of the Sami's Dot typescript, which we see on the left, while others read the published version as an endorsement of the collection's value. For the catalog of Soviet Samizdat periodicals I'm currently preparing to launch at the University of Toronto Libraries, I visited all the major archives of Soviet Samizdat um, I could. Yet it must be said that the archival evidence is fragmentary. Because of this ephemeral quality of the Samizdat text, Samizdat copies were seized and are now in archives that are perhaps inaccessible or buried so that it's difficult to find them. Um, the Sami's dot texts were destroyed. They were perhaps kept safe at home and are not now publicly accessible, or they were thrown away, either because the content was reprinted um, or because it wasn't. It was clear that these documents had to be put in context, traced through their lives and afterlives as Western publications or reports in the press or as mentions in memoirs. The information was in many cases incomplete, ambiguous, or conflicting. This raises the issue of the human element in a way that implicates us as historians 
um, as well as, as many of you here as former participants, despite a reasonably exhaustive review of sources over the course of the last 10 years or so, um, even in this case, we're not dealing simply with objective facts about Samizdat texts or editions. Information about the texts of dissidents, like the legacy itself, demands active judgment and interpretation in order to translate it effectively. I think it's better to be open about the ambiguities and tentative decisions that are made to invite people to amend or add to the historical record. And that's one of the ways in which I hope to provoke a more uh, networked collaboration on this. Drucker has written and spoken about this tendency of digital tools to force us into disambiguation when it is the nature of the humanities and dissidents, as I see as a humanitarian endeavor par excellence, to dwell on complexity, idiosyncrasy, and the partial, subjective, or even accidental. In that humanitarian spirit, then, I want to talk about a few cases of ambiguity uh, and what I think they illustrate. <clears throat> the Moscow Chronicle of Current Events, Chronika Tekushik Sabuiti, the best known and most fully documented of all Samizdat periodical editions, has its own ambiguity in the title. What seems to be most obvious is already a little bit slippery. The title was initially supposed to be the Year of Human Rights in the Soviet Union, and you can see that that's what's in all caps here on this, um, on this copy, with a Chronicle of Current Events as a subtitle. Of course, people took the subtitle for the title, which worked out well, when the bulletin continued into the next year, uh, a longevity that I understand was not uh, initially anticipated. The title then remained stable, and the year of human rights in the Soviet Union continues was the subsequent subtitle. This case is pretty easy, since all subsequent sources treat the chronicle as the title, uh, we can retrospectively assign that title and simply make a note about the initial formatting and reported intention. A more difficult case involves the Chronicle of the Gulag Archipelago, Chronica Archipelago Gulag. This title was reported as such in the Chronicle of Current Events, although documents with somewhat different titles, including the Chronicle of the Gulag, Camp 35, the Chronicle of Zone 35, were also reported and found in archives. Um, there appeared also information on discrete events, for example, the diary of a month-long hunger strike coming from the same camp. According to a report in the emigre publication Vojna Slova, The Free Word, in 1976, materials issued periodically uh, by prisoners of Camp Number 35 in the Perm area were reconstructed as issues number one through four under the title The Chronicle of the Gulag Archipelago by a group of editors in Moscow in 1975. Indeed, this is what we found in a copy in the Bela Usevich collection at the University of Toronto Libraries. Um, A copy of a text coming more or less directly from the Pirm editors was found in the NTS archive at Hoover Institution. And the question was, are these two separate editions or should they be more properly considered different manifestations of the same title? We provisionally decided on the latter because of the relation of all documents to the title established by the Moscow group. It seems uncertain that we would have known about a systematic production of related reports from Perm camp inmates without the consolidation of those documents by Moscow editors. Moreover, the Moscow editors referred back to the Perm camp editors whose original intent they said they were trying to, to make clear. Um, here, it's certainly uh, to be hoped that more information about the Perm camp editors, um, what exactly they put out and, and whether things were intended to be grouped together um, will, be, will be found. <clears throat> Drucker wrote about what she called a pedocritical methodology. 
drawing on Alfred Jarry's Science of Exceptions and Accidents. The exceptions can provide insights into our purposes beyond the imperative of disambiguation and systematization that databases and other digital formats tend to foster. Um, an interesting mystery arose with respect to the editors of Mitya's journal, Meeting Journal, um, that's worth discussing. That is to say, there's no mystery uh, about the actual identity of editors. Dmitry Volchek started this journal in Leningrad, assisted by Olga Abramovich. This is documented in the edition Samizdat Leningrada, encyclopedic um, description of unofficial culture in Leningrad. However, on the back pages of numbers three and four, copies archived at the St. Petersburg Memorial Collection listed the editors unexpectedly as Axel Springer and Isaac Yevtushenko. So should these names be listed? Who are they? Axel Springer, of course, was a newspaper magnate in Germany funding Russian emigre activities in Europe. Was it possible he was somehow supporting this edition in Leningrad? And about Isaac Yevtushenko, I simply had no idea. So I asked Dmitry Volchek about this in an interview, and he explained that, of course, the names were a joke. Although Volchek's editorship of the journal was widely known, the advertisement of a well-known German and a make-believe Jew as editors skewered Soviet distrust of foreigners in a ridiculous way. Uh, this entailed also an oblique jab at Yevtushenko, who concealed his last name from birth, Gangnus, under his mother's more Slavic-sounding name. The name targeted both the anti-Semites who tended to seize on this last name to imply that Yevtushenko was actually Jewish, he was not, and it targeted Yevtushenko's own tendency to adapt himself to prevailing norms, including official expectations of his behavior, even as he played at being a sort of muckraking poet. The tactic of false editorial names fits into a larger pattern of Volchek's playfulness. Um, and here you can see the uh, acronym al Hippi on uh, a copy, or a transcript of a copy of Gastinitsa, designed to deflect the attention of authorities. This is just a playful thing we're doing. It's not serious. Don't take us seriously. Um, and to develop a new aesthetic in Leningrad unofficial culture. This last point was remarkable for me. Boris Ivanov, uh, editor of the Samizdat poetry journal The Watch, Chassi, in his capacity as historian of Leningrad unofficial culture, introduced the authoritative encyclopedia of Leningrad Samizdat um, by emphasizing the apolitical culture, uh, the apolitical character of Leningrad cultural uh, Samizdat and nonconformism vis-a-vis the Moscow dissidents regarded as on the whole political. However, for Volchek, member of a younger generation in Leningrad, Ivanov and the enterprises with which he was associated, including the Watch and uh, Club 81, a semi-official organization through which unofficial networks, including um, the distribution of Volchek's journals, operated, represented the spirit of the 60s. Ivanov and these things represented the spirit of the 60s, serious and socially minded. Volchek was interested in developing a more playful, scandalous, and aesthetically avant-garde alternative. The understanding of political versus non-political, like left and right, depends on one's point of view. And this is my point. The development of Leningrad culture, uh, an offshoot of the larger Samizdat and dissident field originally centered in Moscow, was robust enough to support new developments, even in the early to mid 80s, although this period is conventionally seen as um, nearly a dead time in the USSR for dissidents after the demise of the Moscow Chronicle. As we compare different versions of the text, different versions of information about titles, these discrepancies, the gap between established record or established history and the data that does not fit, provides the space for questions of which we might not have thought for the development of new historical knowledge. That space, of course, demands our active interpretation and transmission of the dissident legacy. 
What I believe this means for the design of a database or archive, particularly in today's digital environment, is that while we seek to resolve questions and gather as much information as possible, we should not have in mind the ideal of a complete or fixed archive. We should openly acknowledge our own role in, in interpreting information and accommodate feedback and additions. The contribution of knowledge from those producers of Semistat who are still living, as well as copies in personal archives, will be crucial to creating a historical record that, if not complete, is still alive in the sense that the process of pushing the boundaries and asking new questions continues. This will be a project in the spirit of the digital humanities as described by Drucker, one that acknowledges epistemological instability forthrightly and presents it as an opportunity for previously unimagined knowledge rather than trying simply to eliminate that ambiguity as a problem. The need to apprehend the open and evolving life of the Samizdat text is a point that pertains also to texts in digital media today. In the spirit of a humanistic approach to contemporary events, as well as a perspective of future history, I want to question whether the recent attention to social media in the case of uprisings in the Arab world does not impose a narrative that is rather too neat, to wit, technology enables mobilization and transforms society. There are social uses, networks, and cultural norms that condition use of that technology. Moreover, I think from the perspective of documenting actual uses, there must be difficult questions about how you capture proliferating ephemeral digital texts. How do you fix and interpret the transformation in the lives of texts? What gets picked up and reported? From where? By whom? For what reason? What becomes part of the historical record? I'm not sure Samizdat tells us how to answer those questions, but it does suggest that focusing on the problems can be productive. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank uh, Mark and the sponsors of the conference for inviting me here and bringing us all together. Am I coming through the mic okay? Yeah? Okay. Uh, so I'm working on a book on the Soviet dissident movement that is trying to do a couple of things that I think were not done when the movement was unfolding in real time and was, and was being covered by journalists and other contemporary observers. Uh, one thing is to embed the movement and to see its participants as part of Soviet society rather than as a cohort of people who somehow existed apart from, uh, which is the literal meaning of dissident. Uh, who allegedly existed apart from that society. So it's to reinsert uh, the dissident story within the framework of late Soviet culture and so-called developed socialism. Another aspect I think that has the potential to push beyond uh, what we currently know or think we know about the history of dissent in the Soviet Union is that as some of the panelists in this, uh, in this morning's session indicated, it was truly a transnational phenomenon and you really can't understand the dynamics of what was going on inside the Soviet Union among the various currents that made up the movement without grasping that the Western gaze on them and their emerging dialogue with the West in various forms of Samizdat, Tamizdat, uh, the boomerang effect of the various shortwave radio stations, the voices, etc., um, that all of those are, are really part of a single network of information flow and eventually of political and intellectual influence. So these are some of the areas in which I think there is um, room for new interpretive possibilities uh, when it comes to the history of this movement and what it might say to us today. Um, and when I, when I say what it might say to us today, I can think of a number of, of sort of zones of significance that the, the story of Soviet dissent still carries. One is as an element of our evolving understanding of what happened to the Soviet regime and why it collapsed so suddenly in a way that nobody could have anticipated. And the ways in which the moral criticisms, um, the delegitimization of Soviet uh, ideology hollowed out the regime before the structure itself actually collapsed. Um, as Anne mentioned in her presentation, and, and there was a posting in the 
uh, Grigorienko listserv by Pavel Litvinov, who is here with us today, uh, lots of people are thinking now about what we might learn from things like Samizdat and the networks of dissent in the communist countries, what we might learn from all that when it comes to thinking about roughly analogous movements in the world today that are decentralized, um, do not often take uh, formal institutional forms of action, that are speaking a language that appears to be recognizable to Western ears, namely the language of civil and human rights, and which are ripe, so it seems, for some kind of relationship with sponsors or patrons in the West. And of course, right now, that's uh, the burning issue in much of the Arab world. But if you think for just a minute, there are many other instances, whether it's China or Iran, of societies where something roughly analogous is happening. And in the Soviet case, we have a closed chapter of, an, of such a history where we can really think carefully about origins, change over time, um, influence of the Western gaze and Western involvement, both on the dissidents themselves and on the regime that was persecuting them. And finally, this is a topic which I think gives us a chance to engage what for me is the permanently interesting question of intellectuals in politics. What happens when people whose metier is the life of the mind try to become politically engaged in their societies? But since the focus of today's uh, panel uh, is on uh, documentation and research, I want to shift my attention sort of to the ground level, not so much to the interpretive possibilities, but to the documentary basis on which some of these questions might be explored um, in a rigorous empirical way. And for purposes of simplicity, I'd like to simply partition the textual universe that is the, the legacy of the Soviet dissident movement into crudely five different groups. Um, they are, number one, Samizdat, about which I will say almost nothing because Anne has already broached the topic and time is limited. Um, the second is the extraordinary uh, quantity and quality of published memoirs by uh, former dissidents. Number three are unpublished materials generated by dissidents themselves, diaries, letters, memoirs that never went to a publisher, uh, various other genres of writing. The fourth is materials about dissidents that was collected at the time the movement was itself developing, principally by um, various security apparatuses and states. So above all, uh, the Committee for State Security in the Soviet Union, other branches of the Soviet party and state, uh, but also on the American side, uh, the State Department, the CIA, the National Security uh, Agency, all of which, of course, were very interested in, in domestic developments in the Soviet Union in the context of the Cold War. And then finally, um, and more recently, the uh, handful of NGOs that engaged with Soviet dissidents in a sustained way, and I have in mind here Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, uh, the International League for the Rights of Man, and various others. So five is not a magic number. Pe other people might partition this landscape differently, but for uh, purposes of clarity of presentation, I thought I would divide the pie up in that way. And what I'd like to do now is just to, to go through some of the examples of the repositories where these kinds of materials can be held. Um, and during the second half of my presentation, I'm going to try to do a little show and tell with samples of documents um, in, in many of these categories. I don't want to repeat the overview of North American repositories that uh, Ksenia went through in her talk. I just want to reiterate the impression uh, that she left us with of a highly, not just decentralized, but fragmented uh, landscape of, uh, of documents. I mean, this is, in a sense, um, the reincarnation of the dissident diaspora, that is, the human beings that made up this movement themselves, themselves dispersed to many, many countries in North America, Europe, Israel, and elsewhere. And the documentary trail that they left behind is similarly dispersed in a kind of textual diaspora. And this means that there's very little, by the way, of coordinated inventories 
Uh, and for researchers like me, it means there are lots and lots and lots of archives all over the place, each of which contains a smaller or larger fragment of the puzzle. So in addition to the North American uh, repositories that Xenia uh, described, um, I want to just mention a few others. For me, um, the, among the unpublished materials about the dissidents, probably the richest mother load and the least tapped mother load is the material that was gathered by the KGB. And uh, I have ha had to basically accept for myself that I, um, in the lifetime of this project, will never gain access to uh, the Moscow KGB archive, or FSB archive, as it's called now. And therefore, much of my strategy for understanding the movement from the perspective of the security apparatus has involved various back doors into that collection. Let me describe a couple of them. First of all, uh, since the Soviet Union broke up, the provincial or Republican level KGB archives of the newly independent states, um, especially in the western borderlands, have become the most fruitful avenue towards these kinds of documents. We heard a little bit this morning about the uh, Ukrainian KGB collection. The one that I have worked with most is the one in Vilnius, where the archive of the former uh, Lithuanian branch of the KGB is almost entirely intact. They did manage to destroy some documents um, in the last days of the Soviet Union, and you can actually see where someone went through with a razor blade and cut out certain paragraphs. But I'm told by the archivists there that essentially 95% of the collection is fully intact, and the Lithuanians are happy to roll out the red carpet and have people come in and use those materials. For the time being, uh, I at least encountered no restrictions on access, no invocations of uh, privacy law or anything else. That is, of course, subject to change based on the domestic situation in Lithuania. If there's one thing I'd like to sort of emphasize programmatically uh, to this audience, it's that apart from those Republican level KGB archives, the single richest vein of materials of this genre have come from dissidents themselves, especially during the 1990s, who took advantage of the very uh, unusual access to their own dossiers that the KGB and its successor was offering. So there was a time when essentially anyone could request uh, his or her dossier, and a number of uh, former dissidents did so to tremendous effect. Um, the Sinyavsky collection at Hoover that Ksenia mentioned, and then I will be showing some examples from, consists largely of Sinyavsky's KGB dossier, which he requested in the 90s and which then passed into the hands of his widow after he died, and then she uh, gave it to the Hoover Institute. And the wealth and comprehensiveness of those materials is hardly to be described. It's much more than simply uh, interrogations of Sinyavsky, statements by Sinyavsky, photos of Sinyavsky while he was in prison. The, the dossier consists of everyone who was enmeshed in what the KGB thought of as the network in which he operated. And therefore, you have interrogations of uh, his entire circle of acquaintances, everyone he ever read anything to when he was trying out his uh, literary works and essays. Um, Vladimir Vysotsky is represented in that group. All kinds of people who you wouldn't automatically think of as having been part of that circle left traces in that collection. And various other people, other dissidents requested uh, when, when the time was ripe, requested their dossiers from the KGB. Uh, Sakharov did so, Solzhenitsyn did so, um, Yuri Shikhanovich recently received permission uh, not to receive, but at least to look at and take notes on his dossier. So these are extremely valuable collections, and I, I don't think the era is over when such requests can be made and, and with a little bit of luck fulfilled and those documents obtained, but only dissidents themselves or if they're deceased, their descendants have the legal right to make those requests. So it's really important that that work continue. <clears throat> In terms of unpublished materials by dissidents themselves, generated by them, not by the security services about them, um, here, uh, again, it, we're, we're dealing with a situation of tremendous dispersion. So 
uh, the two main branches of Memorial in Moscow and St. Petersburg have the papers of some of the key players in the human rights movement. And I, I should have said I'm primarily interested in the, the so-called rights defenders, the Pravozashitniki. Um, that's more than enough to keep me busy. And they were, after all, the sort of umbrella movement into which many of the other streams flowed. Uh, so many of those uh, papers, diaries, letters, etc., are housed in the two memorial archives. I'm going to be showing you some examples from the enormous collection that was donated to the St. Petersburg branch by um, Revolt Pimenov, which include uh, diary entries going back to the 50s, actually include papers by his parents going back to the 30s and 40s. It's 18 boxes. He himself created a rudimentary catalog, but it's essentially an uncatalogued collection uh, of tremendous value. <clears throat> uh, I'm also going to be showing you some examples from the uh, collection in Bremen that was built up over the years by Garek Superfin, and which is probably the single most important repository of dissident papers outside of the former Soviet Union itself, with the possible exception of Hoover, uh, with which it has a kind of rivalry. <clears throat> Before I get to the archival documents, I want to say a word about the published um, record. Like most historians, I, I have a sort of built-in weakness for archival documents because fewer people have seen them, and so the allure of something new and forbidden fruit is higher. But in the case of uh, a history of the Soviet dissident movement, you can't ignore the fact that a truly extraordinary proportion of people in that movement wrote ego documents, wrote one or another form of accounts of their lives, whether it's a full-blown memoir or autobiography or a fragment or a vignette of a certain scene or a certain period in their lives. I like to tell my students that um, dissidents wrote memoirs as, as vigorously and, and actively as Puritans kept diaries. Uh, there's, there seems to have been an, an almost group phenomenon at work here of a cohort of individuals something like a generation, considering its lives worthy of telling. And in particular, worthy of telling to uh, initially a Western audience, since that's where most of the first generation of dissident memoirs were published. What I'm going to do now is switch to my show and tell mode, which is going to require me to sit at the laptop. So I'm going to, I hope this works, grab the microphone that's used for questioners and sit there and, and see if I can get the screen to go on again. So bear with me for just one minute while I try to make the transition. Um, so this is an attempt at a more or less comprehensive database of dissident memoirs. And you can see that I have the uh, name of the author on the left and the Western language, in most cases English, but there are French and German and Italian editions as well, the Western language edition of the memoir. Um, Column F shows you the date of publication, and this is blocked, but it should say 1969 for Marchenko's uh, My Testimony. And I can't fit everything on the screen, but as we move towards the right, uh, the second column, set of columns of data shows the uh, title and date and place of publication of the first um, Russian or Ukrainian or what have you edition outside the Soviet Union. And you can see, um, those of you who work in this field, the familiar names of the, the main publishers, Artis, uh, Chronica, Overseas Publication Interchange. Uh, there's some Alexander Herzen uh, Foundation, the Posef uh, Verlag in Germany, but also some uh, major American publishers, which uh, really surprised me that Harcourt Brace Jovanovich was publishing books in Russian, uh, in Cyrillic, uh, virtually simultaneously with their English editions. And then, the final uh, batch of data concerns if and when these works were published in Russia itself invariably after 1990 when it became possible to do so. And this list um, scrolls down to, I forget what it's up to now, but it's, it's over 120. So down here you see all the ones that have never been published in Western languages. That's why that section is blank. But yeah, we're up to 132. Uh, and this is by no means complete. You'll see some names repeat. That's because a rather significant number of uh, dissidents published multiple memoirs dealing with different eras of their life or written from different, uh, written in different historical periods with different perspectives. 
So there's, there's a lot to be said about this. Uh, let, me, let me just try to offer two thoughts, uh, since I do want to be mindful of the time. The first is that if you, if, th this is currently arranged according by, to chronology of the first Western language edition. And you know, a, a spreadsheet like this can be manipulated to, to be ordered according to different chronologies uh, as you want. But what I've done is order things here chronologically according to the first Western edition. You can see that Marchenko's uh, is the first to come out in 69, followed rapidly by Andrea Malrik, Gennady Shimanov, uh, Yakir's prison, uh, Childhood in Prison, Maro's Boomerang, which came up uh, earlier today. And essentially what, what you're seeing in the first uh, half dozen or so entries are the transitional uh, memoirs that mark a movement from a, the gulag genre, which is the account of imprisonment, either literally in the camps or in prison, uh, but in this case by people who then became active in the dissident movement, that is, who aren't simply recounting time in prison, but, but are uh, marking a transition to activity in what will become the democratic movement. And then by the time you get to uh, Kopilev and Shragin and Vainovich and others, um, these are already, I believe, constituting a new kind of genre. This is a post-Gulag member uh, gu gulag memoir genre and is now the beginnings of what I'm, I'm trying to argue is a, is a new genre of the dissident memoir. And as you can see with over 120 entries here uh, in a movement whose numbers are, uh, we are constantly being told was very small, this is an extraordinarily high proportion of people who thought their life stories were worthy of telling. Um, it's also interesting that uh, in addition to the the many famous names that you see here, and the quite prominent presses, Knopf, Forrest, Strauss, Giraud, Oxford, Harper and Rowe, I mean, this was the, you know, sort of the top of the heap in terms of the publishing world here in New York. Um, in addition to those, once we move forward in time, and especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, we see there's virtually a whole nother generation of dissident memoirs that have not yet, and probably never will be, translated out of their original languages. Um, and those are uh, really a distinct subset. They were not written expressly or so much for a Western audience as the ones from here on up, the, the ones written during the lifetime of the Soviet Union itself. And they offer a very different view of the Soviet uh, dissident movement in part because of, I think, the different uh, implied readership uh, for, these, for these various works. There's obviously much more that could be said, not only about the corpus as a whole, of dissident memoirs, but the individual examples, many of which are, are really quite extraordinary works uh, of self-portrayal. But I'm going to move on to another uh, topic here. I want to take you on a brief tour of the contents of some of these archives where I've been spending my time uh, lately. So I want to begin with the, uh, the category of unpublished materials by dissidents and just show you a few samples of these. Uh, so this, for example, is a page, the first page of Revolt Pimenov's diary from beginning in 1954. It's an extraordinary document in many ways. Uh, he was an omnivore when it came to reading, uh, but what's, I, for me, most unusual about it is that this is someone who both wrote a memoir uh, that was published uh, in Frankfurt by Posev, but also has a kind of parallel diary uh, that can be set in dialogue with the memoir. The me memoir, of course, is retrospective. It's the Pimenov of the 60s, looking back on his formation as a dissident in Leningrad. The diary is telling things as they happen, uh, as we would say now, in real time. Uh, another document, this time from uh, California, is from the uh, Sinyavsky archive, which, as I said, was a gold mine because among the things that the KGB decided to deposit in his dossier were uh, facsimiles of the posters that were displayed at that famous December 5th, 1965 demonstration, uh, which was calling for an open trial of Sinyavsky and Daniel. And as you see here in the first one, respect the Constitution, the basic law of the Soviet Union. Um, whoops, beg your pardon. Uh, the second one, these, by the way, uh, were originally much bigger. They were the kind of things that would have been held up, obviously homemade. You see signs of tearing here. The KGB agents were a little rough. 
Uh, this one, we demand transparency in the trial of Sinovsky and Danielle. And the third, uh, responding to the preemptive arrest of uh, Bukowski in advance of this demonstration, uh, we demand freedom for Vladimir Bukowski and others who've been placed in psychiatric hospitals in connection with this Glasnost meeting. So uh, these are as close as we can get to, uh, at least for the time being, to the actual uh, placards themselves that were held up that day. Um, and needless to say, these will be illustrations in my book. Um, another document, uh, I hope I can find this. Um, this is from the Bremen Archive. Um, sorry, bear with me for a second here. Uh, this is an entrance ticket that was given to a writer, uh, Chinggis Kusenov from Azerbaijan, who happened to be a member of the uh, Union of Soviet Writers and therefore had special privileges uh, that allowed him to attend the trial of Sinyavsky and Daniel in February of 1966. Many people wanted to get in, believed they had the right to get in, but he actually had this propusk, this um, entrance ticket and he deposited this with the archive in Bremen along with his memoirs of that trial uh, day by day and uh, many other aspects of his life as a Soviet writer. Um, why Bremen? Why Bremen? Um, well, Bremen was the home of the, uh, what, what was, is called the Forschungsstelle Osteuropa, the Center of Research on Eastern Europe. And the reason why it became such a powerhouse as an archive is because they were able to attract uh, Gabriel Superfin to be their archivist. And he had uh, very high credibility among the dissident movement, having himself participated in it, been imprisoned. And he was a magnet for collection after collection and single-handedly built it up to what it is today. Uh, let's see, one of the more um, amusing things that I found in the Memorial Archive, and this is a sign of um, how culturally embedded the dissident movement had become by the 1970s. This is actually a crossword puzzle created where all of the clues, both horizontal and vertical, have to do with the dissident movement. And I found this in uh, Pimenev's archive in uh, St. Petersburg. I'll, I'll show you where the, the clues come in. I think here we are. Well, you, obviously you can't read this, but this is the vertical column. So it has things like author of Gulag Archipelago, um, head of the KGB between 1962 and 1967. And I suppose this was to you know, pass away the time uh, and keep yourself up to date with um, the latest trivia, if you can call it that, from the dissident movement. So these are just a few uh, tiny examples of the kinds of things that uh, I've run into in the unpublished materials generated by dissidents. Um, and obviously this is really just the tip of the iceberg. Let me turn now to the state sources, that is material about dissidents captured by or generated by um, the KGB. So <clears throat> let me um, return to my table of contents here. Now. The KGB in the early 1960s had not yet heard of network theory because the sociologists hadn't developed it, but de facto they were practicing network theory. And this is their visual attempt to reconstruct the networks that created the Samizdat journal Kalakol, all of which uh, was organized by a handful of individuals in Leningrad. And here you can see how they have reconstructed the distribution networks of this journal um, emanating from Valery Rankin and um, Sergei Khachayev? What was his first name? I forget his first name in patronymic. Um, but the KGB approached the dissident movement fundamentally as a network phenomenon, as a series not only of face to face communities uh, within towns and cities, but as a union wide network. If there's one thing that I've been able to learn from the archive of um, the so-called Dela 24, uh, Case 24, which was when they cracked open the uh, editors and compilers of the Chronicle of Current Events, it's that the distribution networks of the Chronicle were truly 
union-wide. Uh, those, those who maintained that the dissidents uh, consisted of small numbers of intellectuals in Leningrad and Moscow simply have the story wrong. The Chronicle made its way to and gathered information from virtually every major Soviet city, from Vladivostok to Kiev, and all points in between. So this is a, a kind of a micro network reconstruction here done by the KGB, but there are much larger ones. Um, now another document from this collection um, involves a KGB attempt to re recreate, I wish the lighting were better here. This is basically a map of a train car, wagon by wagon by wagon. And in this car, in the, in, uh, on the 9th of July, 1964, um, somewhere between 45 and 47 leaflets were discovered with what the KGB called anti-Soviet propaganda. And this is their attempt to figure out how those leaflets got there, who the passengers were, and where they went, uh, I'm sorry, where they came from and where they went after they passed through this train. So the KGB spent a lot of time and effort and I assume money, uh, tracking the dissidents. And while, of course, their material is nowhere near neutral, it's extremely informative. It gives us a perspective that we can't get, in most cases, from the dissidents themselves. <clears throat> so common was the tracing of um, anonymous leaflets uh, across the 50s and 60s that the KGB actually developed a special form for recording the number and type of leaflets. This is a document that I discovered in the KGB archive in Lithuania. Um, this is for a tiny little section of the Lithuanian Republic, and these things were prepared for virtually the entire length and breadth of the Soviet Union. And this document, which is marked Savršena uh, Sekretna, up in the upper right, strictly secret, uh, or completely secret, top secret, involves data on the spread of anti-Soviet anonymous documents and the search for their authors. And uh, you can see here, well, you probably can't read all the different categories, I'm not sure I can um, on the screen either, but they're essentially attempting to break down those in which the author is identified or not identified, um, those in which the distribution appears to be random versus targeted to a certain area, the number, and this data was eventually amalgamated um, into union-wide statistics showing the rise and fall of the distribution of these kind of leaflets. Probably the crown jewel of the um, KGB archive in Lithuania uh, got there by accident when Sergei Kovalyov, uh, one of the key players in the chronicle of current events, was arrested um, in the early 1970s, the Soviet authorities decided it would be a good idea uh, to conduct his trial somewhere where Western journalists did not usually go, and they chose Vilnius. So his trial was held in Vilnius in 1975, and that's where the entire paper trail of that trial, including the long, long years of investigation and gathering of material against him, all of that remained in Vilnius. And of course, when Lithuania became an independent state, that entire corpus of materials stayed in the Lithuanian KGB. So this is a 14 volume collection. It's been microfilmed, um, and the microfilm copy is deposited in the Sakharov archive at the Houghton Library at Harvard. Um, but this is, I just picked out um, the cover, cover sheet of uh, one of these um, volumes. So this is the, the criminal investigative record. This is not the transcript of the trial. It's the investigative record that was compiled by the prosecution in preparation for the, uh, for the trial. Um, and this is really the mother load in terms of getting access to materials whose ultimate home is in the Moscow KGB archive. Because in preparing for Kovalyov's trial, I guess they wanted to be as thorough as possible, they arranged for copies of interrogation transcripts of dozens and dozens of people, you really can't read this at all, um, to be sent over from Moscow to Vilnius. So as part of this investigative record, these 14 volumes contain trans, um, transcripts of 
interrogations of uh, Viktor Krasin, of Pyotr Yakir, of Kovalev himself, who refused to answer questions uh, literally thousands of times, um, and dozens and dozens of other people who were dragged in as part of this um, comprehensive investigation of the chronicle of current events. Um, it's, there's not much point in showing you the, the actual documents because the script isn't good enough to read, but um, after you get through the table of contents that I'm scrolling through, then you get to the actual protocols of the interrogations. So it records, it's highly efficient, it records the place, the date, the time, the name of the KGB agent who is conducting uh, the interrogation, and in this case, the interrogatee is Pyotr uh, Ionovich Yakir. And Yakir, by this point, had been psychologically broken and was simply talking and talking and talking. And there are just hundreds of pages of his uh, recorded testimony, and you can see at the bottom of each page, in accordance with KGB protocol, uh, he's asked to sign. So that's, I don't have the cursor here, but yeah, yeah, I do. Actually, I brought my laser pointer with me. That's his signature there, ver allegedly verifying that everything written down here is true to what he actually said in the interrogation. So this is, this is a really incredible uh, collection to work with. Um, I want to wrap up soon because there, there needs to be time for questions and discussion, but just a couple of other quick um, look, looks at documents here. Um, let's see. Yeah, so it took the KGB five years to figure out that Abram Terz was, in fact, Andrei Sinyavsky. He, he, kept, uh, he, he covered his tracks extremely carefully. And one of the things that his dossier contains is, um, are copies of the typewriter analysis that the KGB conducted in order to match the typewriter that produced uh, Samizdat texts of uh, The Trial Begins, Sudidyot, and his essay on socialist realism with texts that they had seized from Sinyavsky's apartment. And so here um, you see just one copy of a page that they used to establish um, which typewriter had been used, and the expert forensic analysts identified the characteristic idiosyncrasies of this particular typewriter. So for example, uh, there's, a, there's an unusual distance between these two letters. So that's number one. And each of these numbers points to something that allowed them to zero in on a single typewriter, which they then uh, identified as his. Uh, so this, is, this was a very sophisticated, high-level operation. Um, and for historians, of course, it's a gold mine because all kinds of details emerge from this. Um, I have lots of other things to show you, but I'll just uh, end with this one. Once I realized that this was inevitably going to have to be a transnational topic, I started working in the archive of Amnes Amnesty International. Uh, so I've begun at the one that's housed here at Columbia in the Butler Library, which is the archive of the American branch of Amnesty International. Um, in May, I'm going to Amsterdam to look at the archive of the International Secretariat of Amnesty International. Here you see a letter from uh, Professor Andrew Blaine um, wondering how to handle the application by a group of Soviet dissidents um, to become a Moscow branch of Amnesty International. As you can imagine, this was a delicate subject, and uh, Mr. Edward Klein, uh, who was present at the creation, so to speak, is here today and uh, has been sharing some anecdotal evidence about the hot water uh, that he and Andy Blaine got into when they assumed that there was no problem with establishing a Moscow branch of Amnesty International. So these are just a handful of pieces of what I hope is going to be a very interesting puzzle, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. In general, we, we have a little time left for questions and comments, and maybe we can even um, take over some of the coffee break for that. <laughs> um, uh, I would like to ask you, if, if you do have questions, hopefully you do have questions, to please step up to the microphone, maybe very quickly say who you are, if I haven't done so yet at this conference, uh, and then you know um, ask your question, please. 
uh, Frank Sisson, uh, University of Alberta and uh, Columbia program in Ukrainian studies. Uh, the uh, uh, printed text, the, uh, the samizdat that gets typed and the treatment of these texts is very interesting to me. One of the things I find in, in work in Western Ukraine at least is that uh, almost every rural family has the story of when in the late 1940s, early 50s, they buried the books or hid the documents they had, when they burned them in the 60s yet. That is a society in which pervasively, and not just in, in, in literate circles, these texts are still treated as very important. And what strikes me is that we are attempting frequently to see this movement as something new, but I think we should also see it as connected, at least in attitudes towards texts. That is, the people who are then in Lviv or Ivano Frankivsk are the children of those rural people who did this. And I think the tendency to see from intellectual circles up, but particularly for this great piety towards these, these, this document text, found very interesting this, the discussion of whether someone would have preferred the uh, Samizdat original text or a printed text, which has much authority, and I think that carries with it. And then, on carrying on, one of the things I found uh, regretted, in a way, with this conference is that we, we have not included Lithuania. I think it would have been very interesting had Lithuania, and as far as I know, the most uh, widely disseminated dissident literature was Lithuania. That is, that reached the most strata of population that went out. Is that true from uh, what you have seen in, in the archives? Uh, that is. Uh, uh, are they dealing with different kinds of people than they were dealing with in other areas of the Soviet Union, if at least the, the Catholic Church chronicle reaches, as we, as at least I've been led to believe, uh, a much, whatever this percentage is, but a much greater percentage of the population is getting it, and certainly people, uh, people in rural areas and in, in, in other, in worker strata of the population that wouldn't, and how, how have you found, uh, found those discussions as to how the two compare with, e with each other? I can't say very much about the distribution network in Lithuania, but simply from documenting what periodical editions were done and seeing that in Lithuania far more were done. There was a lot more activity. Uh, and in discussions with people, it was quite clear that the Catholic Church and a network of people who, you know, including... Um, nuns and people who had devoted themselves to the church and thought nothing of sitting up and, and you know, uh, copying out texts, uh, that this network of production was extremely widespread. Um, and there was a lot more variety, in part because, at least just in terms of periodical editions, there were a lot more titles um, in Lithuania. So a kind of partial impression is that that's probably true. I can't really offer more than a partial impression either because I've, I have yet to find data on um, sort of the user end of Samizdat generally. Um, the material that I found on the networks of distribution of the Chronicle um, were really restricted just to that particular document. Um, all I can tell you on a similarly anecdotal level is that uh, the evidence from the KGB archive in Lithuania shows that these that leaflets were being distributed and people were getting into trouble in, in all of the regions of Lithuania. It was not strictly an urban phenomenon. Mm -hmm. But in terms of hard data about numbers and the social class of people um, consuming Samizdat, I haven't come across it. Uh, Volodymyr Yatrovich, uh, Harvard Ukraine Research Institute. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we found an interesting article in the KGB journal, Trudevishi Shkole KGB, about falsification Danilo Shumuk's memories. These memories were brought in the 17th from concentration camp to the small skip publisher and were a publisher uh, here in the, in the United States. Do you know something about the KGB falsification of some is that? Um. I know that uh, there were documents identified, you can see it clearly in the inventory of items in the NTS archive at Hoover Institution. There were things that, that were marked falshivka and that were simply taken out, um, unfortunately, because I'd like to see what they look like and, and what exactly they were, and there isn't a, a description of them. Um, and, and of course, um, 
anxiety about KGB infiltration or falsification was extremely widespread. Anecdotally, people would say, I know Pietro Grigarienka in his memoirs talks about the fact that people had a, a kind of instinctive sense, um, and Revoit Pimenov also talks about an instinctive sense for what would be a falsification, and it was generally things that were more scandalous. Um, I would think that falsifications directed out to emigre organizations might find a more willing audience, potentially, I, I, although I don't know whether that's true, and I'd be curious to know, um, you know what, what's actually documented. Yeah, I, I also uh, saw that inventory of NTS uh, Samizdat. And by the way, the um, I should have mentioned this. Um, NTS stands for uh, the People's Labor Union, Narodna Trudovoy Sayuz, which was an emigre organization based in Germany going back already to the Stalin era. They donated their Samizdat collection to Hoover, but their, ar their actual archive of their own activities including the many, many people that they sponsored to go in surreptitiously to the Soviet Union and establish liaisons with the dissident movement is unfortunately closed to researchers. This has been very frustrating because it's probably the, the single most significant ethnic Russian uh, emigre organization that existed for almost the entire span of Soviet history, but they simply will not allow people to use their materials or even to see their materials. Uh, I've heard anecdotal stories over the years about this or that document being uh, planted by the KGB. Um, NTS, by the way, prepared an unbelievably realistic looking uh, copy of Pravda, which they smuggled in and which had all kinds of scandalous things to say about Soviet power. Uh, so the two sides were, were playing the, the falsification game against each other. Um, what I've come across much more than actual falsified documents by the KGB are rumors about Samizdat texts that they were allegedly uh, constructed by the KGB. Apparently when some of Andrea Malrik's essays first emerged, they were so sharp-edged that people, began, people at Radio Free Europe, uh, uh, among others, questioned whether they had been planted by the KGB, and in fact they had not. So in many cases we're dealing with rumors that uh, are difficult to, you know, to really nail down. Um, Michael Bernard, University of Florida. I worked a lot with sort of 70s and 80s uh, Samis Dot in Poland, Hungary, and Czech Republic. And you guys seem very focused on the text, but I think there's something else that you can use, which is the actual materiality of the stuff that teaches you a lot. So I'll give you one example. Um, Polish Samis Dot, Dot, which was called Bibuo, was produced with offset technology. And we know in the months before Solidarity, they were bombarding the country with thousands of pieces of this stuff. And this really um, addresses uh, some, something about impact. The Hungarian stuff I saw all seemed Xeroxed. And it, it didn't have the, always have the typewriter feel that all this stuff has, but actually had more kind of, uh, shall we say, ornate kind of almost uh, graphic artist produced stuff in it. And when I talked to some of the dissidents, they told me that their, their, their Samis dot took off in the 80s and they're already private um, Xerox shops in Budapest. So you could literally produce one copy and you could take it to a private Xerox shop and get it Xeroxed and then hand the original back. Um, and then the Czech stuff, the, those, those padlock editions, still have the, the, the carbon copy feel to them. And some of them were literally sewn at, to be bound. And this tells you a lot about the means that these movements had to get this stuff around. Um, the other thing you can look at, I think, is the thickness of the journal. And you can assume that a thick journal is meant for an intellectual. The Polish stuff, such as Robotnik, Platsówka, the stuff meant for workers and peasants was often one or two sheets. And you know, you can, you can know some extent about who the audience is, at least what, what the intended audience was and perhaps where it got by looking at this kind of materiality. So this is really a comment and wondering that if in the Russian stuff that you can see, very, you know, you can make this observation by looking at different materials across countries and understand a lot about these movements. But I think you can also understand a lot over time. And I'm wondering if the Russian and Ukrainian stuff or the stuff from different regions of the Soviet Union by making these kinds of comparisons 
have embedded information in it that you can that you can make conclusions about different regions or different time periods. Well, I will plead guilty to being mostly concerned with content, uh, but Anne certainly should not. <laughs> and I would just mention her article in Slavic Review. The, was it the Material History of Samizdat? I forget yes. the exact title, but uh, anyway, you should. The material the existence of Soviet Samizdat. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, do you want to speak to that? Um, well, I, I, I think that's an excellent point, and it's a case I've been trying to make myself since that early article when I still didn't have um, as much experience with materials at my disposal, but I've also been um, rather more narrowly focused in, in my work. I think that there still needs to be a, a really good comparison of the different um, contexts, including that distinctive Xerox quality of the Hungarian Samis dot, the distinctive sort of fine amateur book editions of the Czech Samis dot. I think that they show, um, you know, exactly exactly what was what was suggested. Something about who was actually producing them, for what purposes, for what audience, um, and what the reach could be. Lacking statistics about what the readership was. Um, which, of course, we'd all like to have, at least now, you know, there's the hope of finding more schemes that the KGB uh, made of these networks, um, but also we can draw some conclusions from those distinctive uh, types of production and distribution. In the Soviet Union, it was almost exclusively in the classic period, which is 1956 to 1986, uh, typewriter and carbon paper, and um, photographs, so actually photographing um, texts and then making copies based on negatives. Um, in the 80s, you start to get more of the uh, photographing of collage effects, especially with, with rock journals. And then there's this kind of outlying phenomenon of the Baptists who did put together um, homemade printing presses from, you know, bicycle parts and, and various things that they could cobble together, but mostly because that was, you know, done out in the woods or in remote regions, and of course they were still found and, and seized um, in many, many cases, which is why we know about them. Um, but otherwise, there wasn't the access to Xerox, tech, Xerox technology um, that you see in, beginning in the 80s with... Uh, in the Hungarian case, and I understand that had a lot to do with um, George Soros money going in to fund uh, Xerox machines um, to, to provide that, uh, because obviously you could get a lot more done. Um, if you can make more copies on the front end, then you, you have a lot more to distribute. If you're working with seven to eight um, copies on a typewriter at a time, obviously you're very limited and you depend much more on a network of people who will rhizomatically take upon themselves the responsibility of producing more copies and passing them on. You also rely a lot more on the Western side to do radio broadcasts back to Soviet listeners um, and to do print editions that can then be smuggled back in and in some cases photographed and passed on that way. Um, so I, I think I think more needs to be done on that. Uh, Henrik Wies, uh, I want to say about the techniques, what you say. Uh, when we started in 70s, um, uh, 76, we start with uh, copies to type in a uh, typewriting machine. We use very thin uh, paper and carbon, and was five, six uh, copies from one uh, printing. Next, uh, these five copies uh, I put to another people, they print five copies, five copies, and it was, but it was completely stupid, it was not uh, uh, working good. And then next uh, problem was to organize machine. First machine uh, offset was from uh, Paris, through the DDR, through West, uh, East uh, Germany, to Poland, to Catholic University in, Pol in uh, Lublin, 1976, uh, uh, seven about. They use offset. But uh, in 1977, our friend, 
Uh, we, uh, that moment we um, uh, edited underground newspaper Worker, Robotnik. Every two weeks was new, uh, new, uh, new, new, uh, new, new Robotnik, new, uh, new Worker. He prepared special technique. It was secret uh, power <laughs> hour during all time and uh, in, uh, after in Poland and Czechoslovakia and Hungary. He used photograph techniques uh, and uh, he prepared, the name, Polish name is Sitodruk. Uh, I see print, I don't know how to, uh, if you have uh, 12, f 13 normal 8-4 papers, uh, during this technique, you can uh, put uh, on the special uh, wood ram, uh, and is, uh, inside this material, and uh, uh, some kind of uh, photograph techniques, and you can very easy construct this. Everybody can, can construct, uh, and a special group uh, was uh, uh, learning, and other people, how to use this, Special group was in, in Czechoslovakia to, to learn uh, other people, and in Hungary too. And uh, uh, in the 80s, it was in each, in each town was special, uh, this uh, group who, who know how to produce uh, this. It was not uh, very dangerous when the secret police could uh, uh, arrest this, because during two days I have new. It's no problem. Uh, and it was our Katyusha in our second report. <laughs> Seems to me that there should be a handbook of some kind done, um, multilingual with examples, uh, types of papers used, uh, the various uh, techniques, um, and that these get into the hands of uh, archivists and librarians who are processing the collections because dating the material is problematic because often there is no date um, and, and or, or often country of origin and Russian language being the predominant one. So I think uh, that that would be a worthwhile project to pursue. Uh, do you hear me? Uh -huh. yes. uh, my name is Pavel Litvinov and I am of the few remaining al alive uh, objects or maybe subjects of your study. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, there are too many things I could say, so I would limit myself to, uh, to, to very few. Uh, first of all, uh, as already was mentioned, different materials in different countries, in, in different uh, what is called uh, Soviet republics, like Georgia or, uh, or Ukraine or, or Lithuania or Russia, was, were completely different periods and, and different types of involvement. Obviously, in uh, Lithuania, there were more involvement of more people, and they could do uh, much more uh, work of distribution and, uh, and printing. Most of the time, in my time of dissident participation, which is st starting roughly from 65 uh, through uh, my, uh, my immigration uh, in 1974, uh, it was exclusively typewriter. Typewriter copies, typewritten copies, sometimes uh, very thin uh, paper where we could do even 15, 20 copies, but the last one was, uh, God forbid, almost unreadable, uh, but still it, it was a copy and somebody try, uh, tried to, to read them. I never saw in my life uh, Xerox type of uh, device until I came to Rome after my immigration in 1974. Uh, so it just was non-existence, but they were to some degree available. And when uh, Alec Ginsburg prepared the work, uh, so-called Bele Knig, white book about the case of Snyavsky and Daniel, one of my friends um, uh, who worked in an academy of science, I can now, <laughs> routinely I won't call her name, but now I can call her name, she's still alive and in Moscow, Lola Alexandrovska, she would come to two people who were basically uh, in charge of machine called ERA, which was the type of Xerox machine of, uh, I think was built in, uh, in Yugoslavia or something, but it had a Russian name. And they could make copies only in presence, there were two of them, they worked only together, 
and they, they, they observed each other, and the machine was locked at all times, and they had to write what is in each copy, so it's, everyone was under control. But they still uh, were, uh, those two young people were young enough, and they did copies of foreign uh, publications, newspapers, which was uh, brought uh, to Alec Ginsburg from, uh, uh, from Holland and from, from Norway at the time, and he included those copies in, uh, in, in Bele Kniga, but that was excluded. And I, uh, we all looked at it as absolute miracle. We didn't know that such thing even existed. I didn't know the physical being physicist, didn't know what physics was involved in, in production it until much later. It was so secret. Well, uh, that's one thing. Another thing I want to mention, of course, uh, it's completely untraceable, but the second life of all some is that, of course, was foreign radio, the Voice of America, Radio Liberty and Radio Free Europe, and uh, of course, very important, Deutsche Welle in Germany, BBC. And how many people listen to that? Uh, it's only anecdotal uh, evidence, but I met anywhere in Russia so many people who heard about me and my activity and the papers uh, which I wrote. Uh, almost anywhere uh, in, in Russia. So there were many people who at least heard about from somebody who listened to that, and that's, I don't think we can only ask people who remember what they heard, but that was very widespread. And I met people, a person in Novosibirsk named Kuznetsov, who would make the magnetophone, a, a, a tape recorder copy of some is that, and then would type it on his own uh, typewriter and would give it to his several friends. So it was kind of second generation some is that. Of course, that was not very often, but I heard about such cases. And the last thing about uh, falshivki, about false documents. There were surprisingly few f false documents uh, uh, done by KGB. They basically knew, at least I can say about Russia, I cannot say much about Ukraine or Poland, uh, that we kind of had a, our, uh, our sixth sense if the material was true or, or, or false. It was so clear what, what is written. People uh, sometimes wrote their names, sometimes didn't, but it was still very obvious that, so that something is included uh, which doesn't look right. Uh, in 1967, 68, I wrote several, uh, was kind of a pioneer who, uh, who wrote several letters about the case of, uh, of Ginsburg and Galanskov and, uh, and case of Bukowski and then com later compiled books about their cases which were uh, circulated in some is that but mostly were published abroad. Um, uh, case of demonstration uh, in Pushkin Square about uh, Bukowski and Haustov uh, demonstration 1966, and then uh, uh, the trial of the four about Ginsburg, Golanskov, and, and others. And uh, preparing, uh, uh, preparing for those books, uh, I wrote several letters which were uh, transmitted by radio with my uh, telephone, I didn't have telephone number at the time, I didn't have a telephone, but my address. And there were people, we called them Khodaki, it was expression coming from Lenin's time that uh, some uh, Russian peasants would come to Lenin uh, and, and they were called Khodaki because they came by foot. They were foot soldiers of, of complainers uh, in Russia. And I literally, almost every day, for two or three months, had people coming and telling me about, the, uh, about what happened to them. There was some, first time I heard about somebody wanted to leave Russia and go to Israel. There was a young uh, Jew came, uh, named Yakov Arlov came to me and said he wants uh, me to send his material. He protests that he and his father cannot get permission to go. Uh, and then there was another from Lvov. So I never heard about Jews who being Jewish uh, by family, never heard about Jews uh, at that time, uh, wanted to, to go to Israel. It was in the beginning uh, of 67, no, 68, or, or the end of 67. So uh, a lot of these documents and, uh, which were brought by this Hodaki, I published in a book, by the way, I, it's probably available called... Uh, Dear Comrade. Uh, what? Dear Comrade? Dear Comrade, yes, yes. It was published in Russian and English 
uh, double lang bilingual edition in Holland and then reprinted in Chicago, in Skokie, Illinois. Um, I don't know how much of it is available, but, uh, but the copy exists. So a lot of these people came. And there were two or three people who came and gave me a document and say, we are students from MVTU. It's the biggest uh, uh, technical uh, university in Moscow, Institute of Vyshe uh, Technical Училища, and said there is a group of students who want uh, to form an organization. And they wrote a letter in my support and say, 10,000 people. It was clearly, and there were many funny things. It was absolutely obvious by looking at these papers. Unfortunately, I don't have the copy. I don't know what happened to it. don't remember. But it, uh, but it was definitely falshivka. Of course, they wanted me to, uh, to give it to foreign correspondents, but I didn't, uh, uh, of course. Uh, but um, so there were some falshivka. But the last thing, and it will concern you, Anne, uh, you mentioned those uh, publications about uh, uh, Perm Camp and Volna Slova. This is also, I'm not saying that all the stuff which is included is falsifica, no. But as a document, as a uh, compilation, it's a definitely falsifica, but made by NTS uh, abroad. It didn't exist uh, there, didn't circulate there. They took materials and, and, and put it together. I cannot exactly prove it. It has to be looked at upon it, but I'm almost sure uh, that we would, uh, Ed Klein and uh, Peter Redway and myself would have known about that stuff. Everything which would come from camp of 35 and 36 at that time, either I would know it in Moscow if it was before my immigration, or we would get that uh, information and would know it uh, here in Chronica Press when we published, uh, reprinted Chronicles and published our magazine, Chronicle of Human Rights. So. Uh, and, uh, and um, I, is, I'm sorry, uh, I would hate to interrupt you, but we have one more question. Uh, maybe we could Okay. Have... All right, I will finish with that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I'll be extremely brief. Um, I just wanted to uh, endorse what Pavel Litvinov in particular has said about the question of falsification, of falsifiki. Uh, I followed Samistat from the Soviet Union from the beginnings in the early 60s uh, for the following 27 years or so. And the number of falshivki that passed through my hands was probably eight or nine. Uh, very, very rare. And as Pavel said, um, I developed a sixth sense as to what was or wasn't genuine. I think the KGB didn't think it was worthwhile to make many because that's, they knew about that sixth sense uh, and it just wasn't worth the trouble. Two cases which I happened to follow up on because I, my sixth sense told me they were falsifications got directly into print by ways that the KGB devised. And one of those was in 1968 when a supposed letter of the 88 uh, Moscow writers was published in the Times Literary Supplement in London by Nicholas Bethel, and he quoted from it. Uh, he didn't give names of, the, there were supposedly 88 signatures. He never would show me the document. The language was quite unusual. Um, I pursued him very strongly about this, asked him where, the, where, the, where these writers were, and he was consistently evasive. And it was clear to me that this was simply a falsification which had been uh, compiled in order to, it was rather hysterical in tone, very un, un, untypical, in order to discredit dissidents. The other one was a case of his friend Alexander Dolberg, who published an article in the Observer newspaper in London saying that a dissident had been executed and referring to the latest issue of the Chronicle of Current Events. I contacted Dolberg and said, um, which issue you're talking about? And he said, well, it's one that's come out in Moscow, but I was told about it over the phone, and I don't have it myself. Um, well, when that issue of the Chronicle arrived, there was nothing about any execution. The person had not been executed. 
So um, it appeared that it had been invented again to try to show the, uh, well, in this case, to show the inaccuracy and unreliability of the chronicle occurrence events. Thank you. To, to round off this panel, I think it only remains to um, uh, give our panelists another round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you.